Hey everybody, I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's really, I, I never thought I'd be like addressing a bunch of game designers. This is so cool. And especially because, you know, um, it's, it's actually pretty intimidating because I would say one of my top three games is Race for the Galaxy and Tom Lehman's right here. So, <laughs> uh, um, and you know, I had to make big sacrifices to be here. I had to drive 10 whole minutes from my house. <laughs> so you're lucky that I, I got here, so. Um, Okay, so I'm Ryan Lockett, um, uh, designer and illustrator. My publishing company is Red Raven Games. Uh, let me talk, a, a, start out just talking, oh, well, let me start by saying um, this is a, a subject I'm really interested in and excited about, and I feel like I'm constantly learning more about it, designing games with a story focus. And there are always things I learn as I design, and I feel like I can get better all the time, and maybe as I talk about this, I can share with you a couple things I've learned and maybe even learn some things from you guys. So um, let me just start out by talking about my background a little bit and it might put some of these things into perspective. So I grew up on 90s video games and Dungeons and Dragons. I know I'm a, a young in here, um, but uh, <laughs> um, this was like my main interest uh, as a teenager. I played tons of like Rifts and Seventh Sea and lots of RPGs. I really got into that and I was so into it because I loved the story focus. Um, and you know, a lot of these 90s video games too. Um, I designed a lot of RPG systems as a teenager, and that I guess some of that sort of carried over into my board games. Now, I, there was a, um, a time where I really got, I, I fell in love with hero games, and that's kind of, I focused on that for a lot of years, and, um, but definitely before that, it was RPGs, so, um, and I started Red Raven in 2011 um, to publish my own games, and I've attempted to include story, more or less story, depending on the game. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see what I have here. Oh yeah, so in 2007, I just wanna show this really quick. This is um, uh, a map I painted in watercolor. This is long before Red Raven existed. And uh, you can see here I had my, my main motivation, one of my biggest motivations for designing games is I love creating worlds and sharing those, with, uh, those worlds with people. And so like this right here, you know, there was a, uh, you know, I had these different nations. There was a frog nation. They lived in the swamp. And there was a desert nation. They sailed on the sand. And you can see the frogs have carried over into, like, every game I've made. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So uh, two games uh, that uh, Red Raven is known for uh, are Above and Below and Near and Far. Now, both of these games, they have a storybook paragraph system in them. And uh, let me just first say that to, to, to design your game with a story focus, you don't need a, a storybook paragraph system in your game. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, paragraph systems a little later on and some of the things I've noticed as I've, as I've done this. Um, okay, so board games with story. Why would you want to sit down and, and design a game with a story focus? Why would that be your goal? Well, one, one reason is for me, it's, it, it becomes more of a memorable experience. Um, now, I like tons of different types of games, um, but one reason I really like story-focused games is because I, there are these moments in the game that, that I remember, you know, and I tell people about. And now, here's an interesting thing, and a lot of people have talked about this lately, but board games are now trying to incorporate things that video games have done for decades. And it's interesting, you know, uh, board games, tabletop games really influence video games, and then it seems like video games are now influencing sort of the tabletop a lot of tabletop games. Um, so uh, yeah, again, these are just some things I've noticed as I've tried to design story-focused games. They might not apply to all types of games. You know, sometimes you just have this great mechanic idea. The game is just based around that mechanic. You sit down, you say, "This is the game," and it's uh, and and then you you know that's the focus. But here, this is not what we're doing. We're focusing on combining a story with a, a strategy board game. Okay, so what are the goals? Let's say, let's, let's, let's say you're sitting down, or I'm sitting down, and I'm saying, I want to design a story-focused game. Let's talk about the goals I have when I'm doing that. Okay, so the first goal is um, get up and cheer moments, okay? Uh, this is something you don't often see in, in Euro games. You know, somebody might ask me, you know, how's, uh, how was that new Euro game you played last night? And I'll, and I'll think, uh, well, we all sat around very quietly I built my very efficient engine, and uh, Joe built his very efficient engine, and uh, we didn't really say much to each other, and uh, the victory points were secret. I thought I was gonna win. Oh, and then at the end, Joe won, and we shook hands, and we got up and left, and it's like, 
<laughs> that can be a really great experience. You know, I love a lot of types of that. I love a lot of games like that, but that's not what we're going for. We're, we're looking for that moment where uh, players are like, oh my gosh, is this thing going to happen? Oh, oh, we're going to die. Oh my gosh, yes, we did it. And you, you stand up and you, you give each other a high five and, and it's like, and then the next day when your friend asks you about a game, you're like, oh my gosh, there was this great moment in the game where we thought we were going to lose or I, I, thought, I thought they were going to steal everything I had and oh, but we made it. So we're looking for that. Okay, next goal, players elaborating story elements based on mechanisms. So this is like when you're playing a game and uh, the story, um, the game doesn't spell out everything for you, but the players, as they're playing, they sort of, they sort of tell a story based, like, they like take the mechanics and then they like, run with it just, to, just for fun. I mean, have you ever played a, a, a game like that where it's like, oh, um, you know, uh, there was a giant troll and we came up to it and we could fight it or we could like negotiate with it. And then I had, a, I had the teddy bear card and the teddy bear card gave me th plus three to negotiate. And we use the teddy bear card and, and it doesn't say exactly why that worked. And then the players are like, oh, well this troll, uh, he actually, what he was missing in his life was like love and cuddles. And, and, and we, so we use the teddy bear and we give him the teddy bear and now he feels fulfilled and that's how we did our negotiating. And so players are like telling a story based on the mechanisms. Okay, and then other non-mechanical player interaction. This is like where players are sitting down and, and it's not, the rules don't spell out everything that they're doing in the game, you know? Like, for example, players will, when they're playing like above and below and near and far, uh, w one thing I've noticed and that I enjoy is when players read the paragraphs and then they add their own little thing as they're reading. Like they throw in like an extra little sentence and, and they're, they're making it their own, you know. And, you know, other things that you can include in this are like verbal cooperation or player deception. Uh, these are things you can't do when you're like playing an app on your phone. You know, I'm in my bathroom and you're in your bathroom a thousand miles away and we're both playing the same game and it doesn't matter that, you know, we can't communicate with each other in any way. It doesn't change the game in any way. We don't want that. We want the game to be to be strengthened because players are sitting next to each other and doing these things. Okay, so uh, in short, this is one thing I, I try to focus on. To best tell a story in games, you must encourage the players to tell it themselves. Part one, characters. Okay, so your first question should be, when you're designing this story-focused game, who do you get to be when you play this game? Now, if the answer is not necessarily very exciting or you can't clearly answer that question, you should go back to stage one and, and figure that out. This is a really important part of getting players immersed in your story focus game. So I'm going to talk about two types of characters, specific and blank page. Okay, specific characters. Uh, examples might include uh, characters in Arkham Horror, the card game, if you've played this. You pick a specific character and you learn about that character as you draw cards from their specific deck and it sort of tells you about their weaknesses or their background, things like that. Uh, Day of the Tentacle, Final Fantasy, Horizon Zero Dawn, lots of video games where there are like cut scenes. These are characters that are written. They, they could be in a movie, you know. Um, the strengths of these type, types of characters, that they can often be very memorable. Uh, you can get an attached investment to these characters. And, uh, you know, um, it can be very entertaining to see these cutscenes and see how the characters react. And, and you'll see where people are like, yes, I'm going to always buy the next game in the series that has this character. I'm always going to buy the next, uh, you know, I can't think, you know, game with this specific character. Okay, now let's move on to blank page characters. Okay, examples might include Link. And I know, I, I, I hesitate to put Link, but I'm putting Link in here because he hardly says a word, um, especially in the old games. Um, Diablo, when you're playing Diablo, um, the characters are more like classes, and you get to name that character, and they don't have, you don't really, they don't really have a, much of a story. Um, Skyrim, you basically c create your character from scratch. Pandemic Legacy, there's more like classes, you know, speaking of um, Rob Davia's games. Um, Pandemic Legacy, you get to name, you know, that character, you get to, get to sort of create their background. Okay, so pros are, for these types of characters, the game often can be more immersive uh, because it's easier to project onto a blank page character. Uh, and I would say in most cases, this is more appropriate to board games. 
so think about this. This is, this is key. When you put creative effort into something, you care more about it. Okay? And so when you're making your story-focused game, give players opportunities to be creative. You know, let them name their characters. Um, like, that's been a, a mainstay of RPGs for years. You know, you get to name your character. You get to create their background. You get to choose their class. Um, and, you know, this is, in, this is in legacy games, too, obviously. It's, it's really powerful when you, even just naming your character. Put in lots of characters that they can be, lots of pictures, male and female, different creatures, uh, different roles and classes, so players can sort of pick what they want to be. Um, let me talk about Scott McCloud's book, Understanding, Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art. If you guys haven't read this, it's actually a really excellent book, and I would say it, it has some really excellent um, things you can learn, not just to, uh, that apply to comics, but also can apply to board games and other storytelling. Um, but I'm going to talk about specifically Chapter 2. So in Chapter 2, um, Scott McCloud talks about the cartoon character and why it and the power of the cartoon character. So you'll see this um, uh, in the book, there's sort of, uh, on one side, there's like a photorealistic image, and on the, way on the other side, there's a smiley face. You know? And as you get more abstract, you could say that that image, um, sort of, pe more people could relate to that image, all the way to the smiley face, which can pretty much describe like every human. And the funny thing is, is it, it, like, there's more power as it goes, gets more abstract. Um, and let me, let me read this here. Another thing is, he says, is the univer universality of the cartoon imagery. The more cartoony a face is, uh, oh yeah, the more people it could be said to describe. Okay, so I'm going to say, um, take that understanding and then sort of think about it. You know, you're thinking about it artistically here, but, but, but switch that and just think about it um, more in like character detail. So the less character detail that, that you're, that you're character has you know you want a little bit but the more people can can put themselves in that in that character okay so let me talk about right here you can see I have some uh, characters from one of my games uh, near uh, I think these are from Islebound yeah um, but also in above and below and near and far now the characters have no names and people have said why didn't you name these characters and it's because players name them themselves and they sort of create their story. As they get these characters, they put them on their, their player board and they're like, oh, this is, you know, Farmer McGee. And then this is, you know, they make up funny names for them. And then they start making relationships between those characters. You're letting the, char the players tell the story of, of the game. These also have more of a simple character design. So it's easier to sort of take the little uh, bits of, of theme and sort of run with it. Like, why does this person have a floating eye sitting next to her? I don't know. Um, yeah, so people name them. So you're encouraging players to tell the story. Okay, part two. Start with story. So this is the ultimate question that, that uh, uh, will tell you the, uh, that, that, that uh, will help us all know the meaning of the universe. But do you start with mechanics or, or would you start with a theme? And I would say if you're designing this kind of game, you start with a story, okay? Write your game, start as if you're writing a, uh, a, an elevator pitch for a movie, okay? Sit down and write a few sentences as if you were pitching this to like a movie producer before you do, do any mechanics, okay? So you've probably heard this before, but I'm gonna say in this mode, you have to think about game mechanics. Um, well, let me read this, if game design is like making a movie, then game mechanisms are filmmaking techniques, okay? When's the last time your friend was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for the new Marvel movie because there's, so, there's innovative lighting? <laughs> Nobody says that. People are excited to go see the new Marvel movie because they want to see the characters. They want to see what happens to them. They want to see the story, okay? So um, mechanisms, your mechanisms are going to be your toolbox, okay? It's like lighting and sound and cinematography. That's, that's in a filmmaker's toolbox, and your game mechanisms are in that toolbox. So you're leading with the story, and you're going to use your toolbox, and you're going to say, how can these mechanisms tell this story? I'm going to, I'm going to start with an example here. Uh, this is a start with mechanics example. This is a game I released last year. It's fine, um, but uh, I actually I, I regret not starting with theme in the, with this game. 
So the truth be told, I started with mechanics. It was a train game, okay? It was a little train, light little train game, and I was like, you know what? There are plenty of train games on the market. I don't want another train game. Let's see what else could fit this theme. And we went through themes, and I thought, yes, the Klondike Gold Rush. This will be perfect. Uh, you know, you build routes, and, and uh, you know, you will buy stocks, and, and it's like, okay, it, it's vaguely similar. Um, but I didn't start with story. I had the mechanics, and we... Yes, we thought what theme would work with these, and I threw in sort of a, a Bigfoot thing to make it exciting, but it doesn't feel real, super thematic. And the question, you ask this question, who do you get to be in this game? And the answer is kind of lame. It's like, well, you get to be a, like a stock person that comes in and you buy different mining shares and then you build mines with those stock. It's like, really? Why don't you get to be a miner that's exploring that's exploring these mountains and you have to figure out how to soften the dirt so you can dig the gold and you have to survive in the harsh weather. It's like none of that's in the game. So um, this is one of the, lots of games are published this way and it's, it's like the worst pitch I hear when people come up and they're like, I had this great game I've designed and uh, you know, it's totally flexible. It can have any theme you want on it. We could do pirates, we could do Cthulhu, we could do cupcakes. It's like, I don't want you to just throw whatever theme on this game, I want you to have started from the beginning saying, this is what we're trying to tell. This is the story we're trying to tell about this, about this game. Okay, so let the story guide the game mechanics. It'll be more intuitive, easier to learn, and it'll be more thematic for the players. Okay, I'm gonna tell you about Near and Far. Uh, in Near and Far, um, let's see. Yeah, we started, uh, I started working on this and you know, I started with a story, but I also started with some, I started kind of before that with some mechanics that I liked. And what happened is uh, we worked on it for a really long time. We kickstarted it, did really well. Uh, and then I, I started doing some final play testing with lots of groups, lots of different types of people. And I wasn't getting the reaction I wanted, you know. And what would happen is in the game you could visit, so there's this town you can visit and you visit town and every time you leave town, you would recruit somebody and you would get some food. And you would get food depending on where they were in this row. It's like a Dutch draft. And so you would recruit the people and, and then, so what would, hap what would happen is people would just go to town, they would leave town, get more people. Go to town, leave town, get more people. And they would do that over and over again. And then, and then later on they would start doing the adventuring, which is what I wanted them to do. And, and I'm like, this is just not exactly what I want. And I knew I would anger a bunch of people and I knew I would annoy a bunch of people by changing the game so late stage, and I did. I changed it, and I thought, what would, what would players actually do in this world? Like, you would have to pay somebody to be on your team. You know, you're hiring an adventure, and you have to go to the farm to get the food, and it was like a lot more thematic. And I think it really helped the game, the final game. I know I annoyed some people, but um, you know, it, it's been successful, and a lot of people are, are more immersed in the setting, more immersed in the story. Okay, so uh, let me talk uh, quickly about my current method. I start usually by sketching or painting the cover of the game before I do anything else. Um, this is kind of weird, right? I mean, this is a very weird <laughs> way to start. Um, you know, write the, again, write the elevator pitch for your game as if it were a movie. So here, let me show you some of my, this is a sketch. Uh, this is from my sketchbook. So you can see here, I, I sketched a, a cover for a game. Uh, and, and I drew some trees and I drew some people in the trees and I thought, okay, this is gonna be an awesome forest survival game. And I started drawing the, the tiles and, the, and, the, and what the resources might look like. I haven't even thought about mechanics yet, okay? Next page, I start thinking about mechanics. I start saying, okay, these are some of the things you can buy. This is how it's gonna work together. Um, and okay, so here's a, here's a cover that I, I painted that I had to scratch because I, you know, I dumped the game. You know, here's another one. So I end up going through a lot of covers I don't use. But so I would say if you're not an artist, it's okay. Just go online or go to your favorite art book and find a piece of art and let that be the concept art and direct you for the whole game. Um, you know, a lot of video games, what, basically what I'm saying is uh, design your game uh, more like a video game studio. Okay, um, now I'm gonna talk about a starting with story example really quickly. This is a persistent open world adventure game set in 1929. This is the thing I'm working on right now. So I started out, I thought, okay, I want this to be a game where you are on a steamship 
and you're lost in a strange world. And so I, I started reading about steamships, and I started drawing out the rooms on a steamship, and I thought, what would the crew do here? You know? And uh, you can see here the different rooms in my ship, and, and uh, they'll have different actions you can do. Here's the, here's the current ship. It's actually, no, this is actually kind of an older version of the, what I'm currently at. But each room, you can do something. There's like a boiler, and it helps your ship go faster. And, uh, you know, you can go to the, the, the sick bay to, to help people, uh, help uh, uh, fix injuries, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, let me tell you about the combat system in this game. So, at first, I thought, I want monsters to attack the ship. I want things to attack the ship and the players. And at first, I put each monster on a different card. And I put those cards, and when it was a battle, I would put the cards underneath the ship. And, and they would sort of, and then the, the crew would have to fight the, the monsters. And then players were like, so where are these monsters? Are they like in the ship? Are they below the ship? Are they outside of the ship? It's like, well, and I'm like, well, they're, they're kind of here. And it's like, it was a real, it was not, you know, it was a kind of an abstract system. And, and it, what, people weren't getting it. So what I did is I took those monsters and I put them, I made them standees, okay? And now you put them in the rooms and they move around from room to room. And it makes so much more sense. And players are starting to elaborate story based on g game mechanisms. They're like, oh, there's a monster in the, in the cargo bay. We have to go up and run up and get it. Oh, he's going to kill uh, Sarah. We have to go send Joe over to save her. And, and, and so players are like telling the story. And it's a lot more thematic and immersive. The battles are so much more interesting. Um, and players are telling the story now. OK, part three, flavor text and story encounters. I'm going to tell you a truth. Most people ignore flavor text. So how do you get people to pay attention? You have to weave game mechanisms into the story text. So I'm going to talk a little bit about paragraph systems uh, at this part. Uh, because flavor text can be a really great way to get people uh, to, to make the game more immersive. Um, now, usually when I see story text and flavor text, um, it's usually in second person present tense. So that's like everything. When you're role playing, I go down to the blacksmith and I buy a sword and I cut the grass. No, and then um, you know, it's a, that if you've ever played Zork or or read game books. Um, also, first person past tense can be great if you've played 80 Days by Inkle. I would recommend it. You could play it on your phone. You could get it here. Okay, so things, these are things that don't work as well in uh, paragraph systems that I've noticed as I've tried to do it. Um, so the first thing is story text with no choice attached, just an outcome. This is an example would be like, your feet crunch on the silty floor of the cave, blah, 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 and you open a moldy pine wood chest, gain two gold. A lot of times players will just be like, ah, yeah, 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 skip through that, what do I get? And they'll get right to the end. Oh, I get two gold. Uh, here's another thing that doesn't work as well. Story text with an arbitrary choice. So an example might be, do you take the path to the right or the path to the left? This is like in a lot of choose your own adventure books. Um, you need detail or choice or the, or, or the choice means nothing. Here's something else that doesn't work quite as well. Uh, story text with a choice, but the outcome for either option is revealed or obvious or has no risk. So again, why would you have to read the the story text. Just go right to the end and say, ah, I want B. So here's, a, here's some things that I've, they've been a little more effective that I've seen. Uh, stakes and tension in the story um, and make those stakes and tension relate directly to the game mechanics. Uh, make it about people. Give a choice but never more than three options. It gets confusing. Hide the outcome. Now players will pay attention to the story text but give clues in that text so players can sort of make a decision so it will influence their decision. Um, it's great if you can put a risk element or sort of resource management in there. So it's like, okay, I, I could choose A, but B is a little easier, but if I do A, it's, it gives me a little bit more, oh, but I have these resources I could spend on A. So now you're making game decisions uh, based on the mechanisms. Um, okay, other tips, don't make it too long. If you've read Stephen King's book on writing, I would heartily recommend it. Uh, in it, he says his formula is the second draft equals the first draft minus 10%. Leave out the boring parts. Cut out the stuff you don't need. 
Think of game writing like poetry. Use fewer words to say more. Uh, if you've ever played a video game with like an hour intro where it's just like cutscene after cutscene after cutscene and intro, and it's like, let me play the game, you know? People are here to play games. I mean, games are never, in my opinion, tabletop games are not a good way to tell a story compared to uh, filmmaking and novel writing. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, also, leave yourself open for happy accidents. Let me, let me tell you this story. So play with lots of people and let those story elements that come out as you're playing come into the game. So in this, okay, so this is a little bit evil, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about this story. So we were playing this, uh, near and far, and in the, in the game, you, there's a story encounter where you run into a bunch of cats. And the mom cat's like, oh, my lost kitten. I've lost my kitten. And... Uh, Will you find my kitten? And you say, okay, I'll go find the kitten. And you find the kitten, and you bring it back, and the mom, and the, and the, the mom cat says, will you, take the, will you take this kitten with you? I have too many. I can't take care of them all. And you say, okay, and you get this card. And when somebody got the card, and we were going along, and then later on, they're like, you know, I, I, need, I really need one more food to do this thing. And, and they're like, can, can I eat the cat? And I'm like, no, you can't eat the cat. And then I thought, no, that's actually really funny. Um, <laughs> What if you could eat the cat? <laughs> so we didn't spell it out exactly. It just says, we add this little thing, discard this card to lose two reputation and gain one food. So um, <laughs> you can eat the cat. <laughs> Have you eaten the cat? Oh, there you go. I so bad. I, yeah, that's good. I mean, if you can't be evil in a game, then what, then, you know, what, what, does, it, what does it mean to be good? It's necessity. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me just talk about Empires of the Void 2 cards really quickly. Now, this is something we did. I would say it was moderately successful. I wouldn't say it was totally successful. It was moderately successful. But these are action cards in the game. And each action card, first, early on, it had a, a paragraph describing what the action did. And so you would, like, play the card, and you would have to read, like, six sentences. And it's like, no, nobody did that. They would just play the card. And so what we did instead is we changed the title of these cards so it was more of like a first-person, one-sentence thing. And it was like you're role-playing. You play the card, and in the rules it says, read the title of the card. And the title of the card is a first-person phrase, like, I share new research with the Ikrins, or I rescue a lost expedition in the deep forest. Now, I wouldn't say that everyone reads these. Definitely not, but more people do now. Okay. Okay, and the last thing I'll talk about is cooperative versus competitive. In my experience, this is just a thing I've noticed, it's much easier to weave story elements into a cooperative design than a competitive design. Um, and I would say this is because of fairness versus surprise. In a competitive game, you have to always, you have to at least try to focus on being very fair because it, it won't make sense uh, if a player wins and they didn't feel like they won because they made good decisions. Um, so you can't be as surprising. Um, and, surprise, and, and surprise is a big part of storytelling. So I would say in a competitive game, you can throw all the sort of, or in a cooperative game, you can, you can throw all sorts of uh, curveballs at the players and they will accept it as part of the challenge uh, more readily. And so you can really, t uh, it's easier to tell a story. You know, unexpected events and things that happen in the game. Um, so let me just finish by saying uh, this again. Encourage the players to tell the story in your game. Give them opportunities to be creative. And uh, that's it, and I'll leave the rest open for any questions. Uh, for some of the games, they have the characters like you were talking about, and they're generally standard. I mean, they have differences in the specifics, but are generally the same, but there's a couple special characters that are in there as well. And so I'm curious to know, for those games with the, the special characters, I mean, like they're like a completely different species compared to everybody else, for example, are you driven for those more to say, hey, there's a cool species and I'm going to wedge that thing in there, or, man, I really need the game to do this and none of these guys are going to do it, so I'm going to put like the frog guy in there to make it happen. <laughs> How do you go through that process? Uh, for me, it's usually like, I'm, I really want to, the motivation is usually like, I really want this kiwi looking bird in my game that carries packages that's huge. And it's just like, how can I fit it in here? Oh, it could, it could carry things for people, you know? So for me, it's like the story thing came first. I wanted a big kiwi bird in the game and I figured out how to make it work, you know, mechanically. So 
Is that kind of what you mean? Any other questions? Yeah, this is the big challenge in story-focused games, uh, especially paragraph system games. Um, usually the, the, the way to com combat that is to just put in tons of content. Like in Tales of the Arabian Nights, like you could play that so many times you're always going to run into new paragraphs, new stories. Um, but, you know, the truth is a story-focused game like that is never going to be as replayable as, you know, um, games that were designed from the get-go to be totally random and, and replayable every time. Um, I mean, that's why, honestly, in Near and Far, that's why I'd put the Atlas in the game. That's why I put 10 maps in the game, because I thought, if it was just one board, yeah, people are just are going to get bored. It's only going to play at one time. So I would say there's, it's a lot of work. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I often, I play a lot of video games that cost like fifty, sixty dollars and I can play it through once and experience the story and you know, that was good and maybe a year or two later I'll play it again, I'll have forgotten some of the story and I can enjoy it a second time. But yeah, the truth is it just won't be as replayable. Um, this is not my question, but just to respond to that also, I yeah. mean, I've always been I think it's really interesting that I mean how many I will go watch King Lear, you know, 50 times or watch Star Wars or Airplane over and over again. So, I mean, I think that there's, you know, there, there are certain types of stories that people will go back and revisit, but, you know, yet we have this feeling like in a game that it's always got to be something different or it's got to go a different place or people will replay Half-Life or something, you know, in a right. video game. I think there's other ways to approach that story. But um, I was struck what you said about in terms of your approach to artwork. I, um, so I, I teach at the NYU Game Center and they, they're, the kids are primarily there for video games. And I got into a big conversation with the, some of the video game instructors and they teach the kids when you start a game that you, um, you start with these vision boards of the artwork and you, know, you do the mechanics, but the artwork and the ambiance and the style, that that's all part of that first thing. And then I teach them board game design and I'm like, don't do the artwork first. Don't worry <laughs> about that. You know, you're gonna yeah. take some index cards and scribble on them and take some post-its and you know, grab some cubes and push them around and try to figure that out first. Um, so I was really struck by you saying that you also kind of, you know, starting with the cover, starting with that feeling that that's a way that you used to drive that experience. And so I'm kind of, you know, and almost all the designers I've spoken to are the same way from board game side that they say, don't worry about the artwork early on. Um, yeah. I, I, and so now I'm kind of maybe kind of rethinking that a little bit, but you know maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on what you feel that brings to your experience. Yeah, so I'll I'll tell you, um, part of my uh, motivation for including this in the in the presentation is because I heard you guys talking about it on L Ludology podcast. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that is interesting um, because I do throw away like I, I I put up those covers to show like I. Th I throw away it's a lot like of work. It's extreme artworking. <laughs> you know, to, to start on the cover is like, I mean, that, that I find that incredibly striking. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is a weird way to go. And I think there's maybe a middle ground there. But I do think that oftentimes, for me at least, um, when I start out thinking about design or, you know, graphic design and, and, and theme and cover and art and all that stuff, I, I feel like the end product feels more uh, um, cohesive. You know, there's definitely like everything feels like it meshes together and and, you know, not everyone's a designer. And the thing is about board game design is in video games, you got a whole team, right? There's the artist and there's the designer. But often for for get board game designers, it's you, you know, and if you're not an artist, like that's that's kind of you don't want to really be drawing stick figures. So um, but, you know, you can that like I said, you can use you can look for concept art and sort of let that guide your yeah. your design process. But I could have seen that. I mean, I just, um, I know you have a question, but trading, like we, we have trade on the Tigris, which started as trading in the Mediterranean, which is a whole other story about Rob's things about first impressions for names. <laughs> but not so like trading in the Mediterranean. 
But you know, they chose a very color, you know, cartoony artwork style, Tasty Minstrel, which we didn't see till you know five years after we started on the game. If I had known, I mean, if I there are things I might have changed about the game seeing the artwork style that they chose for it. So that that also goes. Right. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, just for those who are streaming, um, this gentleman says he um, he does the title. He makes video games and he puts the title music with the um, and the cover before he designs the game. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic. So I want to jump on it as well. Uh, it seems to me that for uh, the ideation stage, a lot of times you think of lots of different games, and I know a lot of designers will talk about. They write down 100 ideas and prototype maybe 10 and then actually design fully maybe one. And in that kind of process, it seems like it would be really challenging to come up with art and, and some kind of, even if it's just like you know a Pinterest board and just some ideas of what it might look like. Um, but I think that each of us probably has a little bit of an idea in our head when we think of that game of the general genre, the overall feel and, and the look. What I wonder about folks like yourself who really do evoke so much of the game and, and kind of bring it out before the game is fully designed, do you find that you work from fewer ideas and tend to bring more, a larger percentage of your ideas to fruition? Um, no, actually the funny thing is I, I feel like I dump tons of my ideas. I, I end up working on them quite a bit and then um, shelving them. So, <laughs> but uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a sketchbook stage where it's like it, the game sort of, uh, marinates on the sketchbook for a while. I'm sure you guys do the same thing. You got note pages and it sort of sits there and you scribble out things and you write new things and and it's and then and then you get to that point where it's like, okay, let's try out some of this. So Thank you. I, I feel like between what Rob has said and what you've spoken about, we're all learning that you can't really think about illustration and graphics at the end or let the publisher deal with it, that really we maybe need to bring more of that into our process and rethink some of those truisms we've had about, ah, leave the art to later, so thank you for that. Yeah, and I know that's tough in the, cur the current way this industry works. Like, It's not like the video game industry where the development team is like, okay, we're going to design this Han Solo game from the beginning, and they start doing artwork as soon as they start working on design. You know, It doesn't really work that way in this industry very often. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So for for me, yeah, doing a sketch, fifteen minutes, you know, and then, and actually doing a cover now might just take three or four hours. So I can spend an afternoon doing it. So if I do end up trashing it, it's not like a, it it doesn't hurt so bad, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. I'm sure you have tons of writing that you end up not using. Yeah. Uh, so you started talking about, you know, this whole talk is about games as a, you know, story focus to make the experience memorable, which goes back to what Rob did in his keynote about, um, you know, games as an experience. Um, have you considered ways to focus on making, like, the story memorable? Because I find a lot of times the moments are memorable, but the story is just kind of like in the background, like, that you don't remember that after the table. You remember that moment you gave the kitten to the troll, you don't really care about the adventurers actually killing the bad guy. You know? <laughs> right, right. And that, you know, that's something I'm constantly learning and trying to get better at. Um, I would say definitely in games like moments are the strong point. Um, overall story, it's harder to nail down just because of the structure of how games work, I think is, is what, part of what makes that difficult. But, um, you know, there are lots of, like I mentioned, Stephen King's on writing book. There's a lot in there that's um, that can that that I think I could apply personally to like overall story. He talks about 
what makes you know pacing and stuff like that and what makes the whole story cohesive and interesting so I, you know we can learn from writing <laughs> So you mentioned that um, something that I've noticed as well, which is that it's easier to get players to buy into the story when they're working together. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, it's a shared experience. I also feel like just mechanically and in a competitive game, um, you have that problem of player turns. So players are either just waiting for their turn. They don't really care what you're doing. Or you deal with that the Euro way, which is by giving them a lot to think about. Um, and then they're still not paying attention to thematically what you're doing. They're yeah. crunching numbers and not talking. And I was just wondering how much you've tried to deal with, I'm just going to go ahead and call it the player problem. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, one way is to force one of the players to read the story to the other player, right? That sort of forces the two people to be participatory and kind of organically gets other people to pay attention because of story time. But I mean, are there other ways that you've thought about to sort of, in a competitive game where people are just sort of itching to go, they've got a plan, they're excited about it, how do you slow the game down without it feeling like you're slowing the game down and it's just, you know, painful? Yeah, that's, that was a big challenge. That's always been a big challenge for me. And that was one of the biggest things for Near and Far because like, yeah, you make one player read, that's great. The other player listens. But then you got this mm -hmm. big competitive. This is like the biggest, this is my biggest competitor right here. Mm -hmm. When people sit down, they're always looking at this, you know, and it's like, I don't want players to have a moment where they can pull out their phone. Um, so what, what we did with near and far, I, at least if I, w the way I can remember it is the turns, you could do a lot more in your turn. And so this is, a, I, don't, I don't know if this is obvious or not, just making the turn shorter. So we basically cut the turns in half. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is with that is that players feel like, oh, I didn't get enough done on my turn. But the thing is, your turn comes around really quickly, so, you know. Yeah. So that's that 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 keeps players from pulling out their phone because they only uh, they they only have a, a short time. But yeah, that is a big challenge. I mean, another way to do it is make the story affect the play the player, mm -hmm. but have also repercussions that affect every player in some way. Or like affect the game state. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, when you were talking about Stephen King's on writing, it made me think of uh, a lot of the screenwriting classes I've taken. I, I was studying screenwriting for several years, and they talk a lot about you know three-act structure or sometimes four-act structure, pivot points at the ends of specific scenes where there's a choice that can take a character in one direction or another. How much are you thinking about acts and, and pivot points when you're coming up with a story for one of your games? I am thinking about that. Um, I would say part of me likes the idea that, I, like, I, I don't like games as much that, are, that feel more, like, um, programmed, where it's just like, we have to go to A, we have to go to B, we have to go to C, and it always goes from A, B to C. I think part of the fun of games is, is sort of having that, even if it's an illusion of choice. So, like, that's one, that's another, that brings up that challenge again, is when you have random events it's harder it's a little bit harder to make a, a you know an abc arc the way that maybe a movie would uh, that's finely tuned um, but i think you're giving up that sense of freedom when you program the the game too heavily too much so it's there's a give and take there that's why i say you know games will never be as good at storytelling as movies are so how do you work towards a satisfying ending then? It seems like without some sort of an arc, the, the middle part and even the setup is much more straightforward, but bringing it to a satisfying conclusion is more challenging. Yeah, um, that's true. And, and the, it's, it, at this point, it, I could say I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there are things I'm learning all the time. One thing I, that you can think about is game design in general, there should be an arc anyway. And so there should be sort of a narrative arc. We'd always talk about that in game design narrative arc. It's like getting, you're starting from something and it goes to something else and it gets bigger and it ends somewhere else. And I think the story will naturally follow that if you, if you weave that into your mechanics, if that makes sense. It's a little abstract, I guess, but yeah. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody.